Welcome to this symposium on Gaza. I'm John Tierman, director, executive director of the MIT Center for International Studies, and we're co-sponsoring this with the MIT program on uh, human rights and justice and four organizations from Harvard uh, in, uh, well, I don't want to call it unprecedented cooperation, but a nice <laughs> bit of cooperation uh, on this. Uh, the Middle East Initiative at the Kennedy School, the Center for, for Middle, East, Middle Eastern Studies, the uh, Harvard University Committee on Human Rights Studies, and the Human Rights Program at Harvard Law School. And um, in that spirit, I want to thank some of our, uh, our colleagues at Harvard, particularly Hilary Rantisi, uh, Rantisi, who was uh, instrumental in pulling this together. Uh, Nitin Sani here at the uh, uh, postdoc at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and Michelle Noosh, our uh, Director of Pro uh, Public Programs, all of whom worked very well together, among many others. There were quite a few people on the organizing committee uh, to pull this together. So we're very grateful for that cooperative effort and grateful for your participation today. Uh, in a moment, uh, our moderator, uh, Nancy Canwisher of the uh, of Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences here at MIT will moderate the first panel. Uh, but at the outset here, I will introduce um, our first speaker, uh, Congressman Baird, and then we'll go to the panel. Uh, and after uh, the panel, we'll have uh, some time for question and answer before we begin the second panel around 4 o'clock. Congressman Baird needs to uh, leave to get back to the Capitol to, uh, to vote on some important issues later today, so he will have to leave after his talk, but we hope to have at least a few minutes uh, for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Representative Brian Baird is beginning his sixth term uh, in the House of Representatives. He's chairman of the Energy and Environmental Subcommittee uh, and has played a leading role on a number of those issues. He also spent time very recently in Gaza with a uh, small congressional delegation. And it was, uh, it was that visit uh, that occasioned us to want to have him here today to get an eyewitness uh, report from Gaza. So uh, without further ado, as they say, let me introduce and welcome uh, Congressman Baird. Well, thank you. It's just a delight to be here at MIT, and I want to thank you for hosting this conference, which is so crucial about a topic that seems so far away, but uh, uh, is really affects all of our lives in, in ways we may not fully appreciate. I want to thank the co-panelists. I apologize that I have to go. We have to get back to D.C. for votes tonight, uh, but I'll, I'll follow the, the rest of the conference as well. Uh, I, I, in hindsight, kind of wish I had, had thought to bring some uh, video uh, because the old phrase of a picture is worth a thousand words really is true in Gaza. Uh, and if, if you're interested, uh, you're welcome to look on my website. Just go to any search engine and type in Congressman Brian Baird. Go to the official website. And under, there's a little section called video. Uh, click on that, and there are images, movies, uh, film we took while we interviewed people in Gaza, in Sderot, Israel. And uh, you'll see uh, people in Sderot, for example, talking about the pressures they experience with uh, rockets coming in on a daily basis. Uh, and then in Gaza, you'll see images of uh, schools that have been destroyed, hospitals burned. And uh, sadly, because of the weather, we, we didn't get to uh, very good footage of, of an industrial area, which, which I'll talk about in just a minute, but it, it is an, a very large industrial area where literally every building has been absolutely demolished. Um, not just a round tank round through because somebody was taking shelter and firing back, but complete and utter, utter devastation of, uh, of a number of buildings. This trip uh, was certainly not my first trip to the region. I've been uh, going for about 10 years. I've had the privilege of attending the World Economic Forum in the Mideast uh, several years uh, and have been to the West Bank, to Israel, to Doha, Qatar, 
to Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Egypt, Jordan, etc. I would not by any means pretend to be an expert on the, on the subjects. I've learned over time that it's, you know, the analogy of peeling an onion. In this case, you peel the onion and you realize you're in an onion field and uh, there are always more onions to be peeled and the more I know, the less I, I know, which maybe is a salutary thing for members of Congress because so often complexities get simplified into there's a good side and a bad side and we're on the good side, which not always the case by, by any means. I went uh, to uh, this trip actually to participate in the U.S. Uh, Islamic Forum uh, put together by Brookings and the Sabin Institute uh, in Doha for three days. I went with Keith Ellison. Uh, some of you may know Keith is the, uh, he's a member of Congress from Minnesota. He's the first Muslim American ever elected to Congress. A wonderful young man, an attorney, uh, brilliant, and, uh, and also just a great guy to travel with. We went uh, three days uh, this trip to uh, Doha, Qatar to participate in this conference. Then we went uh, to the West Bank, to Jordan, to Jerusalem. Uh, after visiting Gaza, immediately the next day went to Sderot. So we wanted to get, uh, we were there for about a week in total. At, uh, coincidental to our visit to Gaza was a visit by Senator John Kerry. He was, uh, Keith and I were technically the first people into Gaza from our government in over three and a half years. Partly that's because a group had gone in about three and a half years ago and had been blown up and killed. Uh, DynCorp group had been uh, uh, hit by, an, I think, an IED. And uh, so we were the first to go in. Keith and I opted to not have any security. We went with uh, UNRWA and uh, basically uh, visited, spent the entire day touring around the city uh, and the industrial area. We visited schools, the American International School. We visited the Al-Quds Hospital. Uh, which is, uh, I think, a very moving brief video on my website. Uh, Al-Quds was hit uh, and burned, much of it. The top floor, I was a neuropsychologist by training, and the top floor of Al-Quds Hospital had once been a, a play therapy center for kids. And you have this bizarre and tragic juxtaposition of images literally of Disneyland characters, the, the happiest place on earth, and you've got Goofy kind of running and Mickey and Minnie and whatnot, and yet the the, the view of these happy paintings is obscured by roofing uh, boards that have burned because the buildings and you're, as you walk through this once play area there's shards of material everywhere and the place has been virtually destroyed. Uh, half the hospital was entirely destroyed. The, that particular wing is in, inserviceable but uh, maybe one day they could repair that. We went to the uh, uh, American International School which some of you know was completely leveled. A very, very powerful interview is on our website again with the principal. And what was, I think, quite moving for us was we, we dug through, literally dug through the rubble and found uh, uh, the uh, school yearbook. And, and the motto, motto of these kids was, uh, in this school was, our leaders for tomorrow. And they taught Western values. They taught uh, openness, they taught uh, freedom from discrimination, empowerment of women, liberal thinking, etc. And as we do the interview with the principal in the background, the entire school has completely been leveled. I mean, it is unimaginable, complete, utter, utter destruction, not just around through the whole thing's wiped out. I also found in the rubble a, uh, a book, which I pulled out, of, uh, about American baseball in English. It was scholastic. You know, we all read these things as kids, scholastic book service. And it was apparently the teacher's edition. And what was lovely in it, I read it, and it had little sticky notes inside. And it was a little damaged, not surprisingly, kind of beat up, in fact. But one of the sticky notes was on a, a, a chapter about Jackie Robinson. And the teacher's sticky note said, what is it about this chapter that helps you understand the meaning of the word prejudice? And I thought, how lovely. They're teaching these kids using American baseball about what prejudice means and how tragic that it's in a, in a school that has been wiped out. Uh, we also visited U, UN relief uh, uh, had, uh, centers and also Mercy Corps centers, met with some of the relief workers as well while there. And then the next day uh, went in uh, to Sterod, Israel and met with the people who are dealing with the mental health effects and in some cases physical effects of the rocketing that comes in. An absolutely untenable situation. No one would want to live in a situation where on any given day uh, rockets come in randomly, typically uh, at roughly school hour, 
and uh, where you worry when you send your kids to school if they're going to make it back or not. And we met with mental health workers there. We visited a home of a person whose home had been hit. And then met with uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, leaders of the community. And then also then that evening met with some Israeli leaders. So that's a little background of the trip and, and what we saw. And let me briefly share with you some of what I think the take home messages are for me. Uh, my own belief is that the urgent need is to allow more aid into Gaza. And it's not just a question of volume. It is a question of, of, of quality and, and, and types of aid. The uh, Israeli uh, administration is basically being uh, rather extraordinary in what they choose to let in or out. For example, lentils are not allowed in. Lentils is fairly staple food. That's considered a luxury. Macaroni is not allowed in. Tomato paste is not allowed in. Uh, uh, toothpaste is not allowed in. Now, we asked about this and, and got, frankly, unsatisfying answers. And it, to me, it's not the issue. I have to say the issue is not whether someone says, oh, aren't we wonder if we let macaroni in? The issue is more problematic than that. What is the message that you're sending someone when you can say you can't have even macaroni? And, and I, I, I try to say, well, what if someone set up shop on my front door one day, and when I came back from the Safeway with my bag of groceries, they said, well, let's see what you got in your bag, buddy. And, and they started pulling out my macaroni and my toothpaste and said, sorry, those are luxury items. You can't have those. And my answer, frankly, would be, well, who the heck are you to say I can't have macaroni? And that's the bigger problem for me than whether or not it's a specific commodity or not. So immediate expanded relief. The other thing I just have to underscore, the utter and complete destruction of any economic means of self-sufficiency was astonishing. And it hasn't, it's tragic, and I went in part because I have twin four-year-old boys, and I had seen a picture in the New York Times, I think, of, of three little children, about the age of my children, and for all the world, they looked like they were laying there asleep. They could have been my kids taking a nap except that right behind them was a father who was just torn apart by his grief because those three little boys my children's age were not sleeping they were dead as horrific as that is you also when you see the devastation of the industrial area utter complete annihilation of any means of economic self-sufficiency and we met with a uh, gentleman who actually had his phd from ohio state he was the owner of one of the buildings they made the, uh, they made biscuits and ice cream in this building. PhD from Ohio State. He said, here's the Caterpillar generator we bought from the United States last year, hundred some thousand dollars. It was destroyed. Not because someone was hiding in it. Everything. You have to understand, it was all gone. Any vehicle, any generator, any room that could be used. Again, not just around through the wall, flattened bulldozers driven over the top, vehicles pushed in front of bulldozers so that they were completely and utterly ruined. We asked a high-ranking official that night uh, on the Israeli government why this was necessary. Why did you have to, what was the strategic interest in going in and destroying uh, this in this fashion? And it was sort of Sherman goes to Atlanta kind of destruction. And the answer was, it was telling, I thought, because it was really in a way a non-answer. The answer was, you have to understand this is Hamastan. This is Hamastan. This is a subsidiary republic of Iran, uh, as if by saying that, that therefore de facto justified the strategy. I, I personally don't think it did by a darn sight. I think, to be perfectly honest, that it was a counterproductive strategy and endangers, most importantly, from my own uh, perspective, as wearing this pin of the United States Congress, our United States security. And, but I also, frankly, believe it's not uh, conducive to the security of Israel when those things happen. I think it is, in, in the long run, contrary. Uh, if the immediate need is for, for relief, expanded in types, the reason I say types is it's not just macaroni. You need rebar, you need concrete, you need glass, you need things to rebuild houses with, and none of that is getting in. When you get to the border, which is this enormous modern checkpoint with big walls, it reminded me, I used to work on... Uh, institutions, uh, mental hospitals, when we had the, the unit for folks who committed crimes, serious crimes. It's like going through that, multiple stages of checkpoints, big walls, 
and, and I have been, by the way, in the past to the uh, border in Eastern Europe in the, in the pre-communism uh, days, and it had that feel, but there's nobody there. there I mean, there's you know, a desultory group of a dozen or so relief workers trying to come in, but that's it. There, it's, it's almost deserted. There's no commerce. There's no human traffic coming out of, I don't mean human trafficking, but I mean just people coming in and out to go to work, to get to hospitals, etc. I think that has to change. I think there must be more liberalization of people, move, people and goods moving in and out so there can be some economic viability and people can visit relatives and visit uh, doctors and things of that sort. Uh, they certainly have the facility there to do so, I think, in a way that would not be hugely jeopardizing of, of security. They have an incredibly sophisticated tunnel system people go through to get searched, and, uh, and, and they could use that. Beyond Gaza, I think it's important to also talk briefly, and many of you know this certainly better than I, but beyond Gaza, we also have been to the West Bank on a number of occasions. I visited Augusta Victoria Hospital, and there's a Lutheran-supported uh, uh, hospital where the doctors and nurses are forced to take a two-hour detour to get to work every day, as are patients who are receiving chemotherapy and kidney dialysis, et cetera. For them to get to work at the hospital, they have to take a much long and circuitous route. And the question I have to ask is, how would I feel if I were the father or mother, parent of a child who's, who's needing kidney dialysis or chemotherapy and instead of driving to the hospital, I'm forced to take a public bus vastly out of my way, get out of the bus, wait in a long line, get searched every single day, pass through, get on another bus, come in, only to an area where the, the, the doctors and nurses might not actually be there because they had to go through a similar kind of delay process. And there's, there's also an interview with the, the director, Dr. Nasser, uh, of our, uh, on our website of that. Beyond the immediate relief in Gaza, then, I think we must urge greater freedom of movement, particularly within the West Bank. Uh, commerce can't occur there right now. And the bottom line has to be this. If we truly want to defeat extremists, we have to reward moderation, and we're not doing so. In my judgment, we've basically, for many, many years now, essentially left Mahmoud Abbas and, and Salam Fayyad uh, kind of hang out to dry. Uh, we've said you folks have to get your police force in order. They've done that. We've said you have to stop terrorists coming in. They've largely done that. We've said you have to keep things under control during the Gaza event. They largely did that. And yet, and this will be my, my final point, and yet on a daily basis, settlements expand. If the United States were to make a public statement that would dramatically improve our standing in the region, I think it would be this. The settlements have to stop immediately, not another brick. It's partly, it's U.S. policy already. Omer has said it was his policy in the past. It would be a profound statement to the entire region and to the entire world that we are serious that peace talks as they move forward cannot be used as a smokescreen to allow the continued encroachment on territory in a way that's contrary to official U.S. policy. Uh, now, I, I will close by saying I think that's especially important with the current uh, Israeli elections. Uh, with Ms. Mr. Netanyahu at the helm, with Betanu as uh, uh, allies with Shahs, I don't see this coming from that or that group of folks in Israel without some U.S. pressure. And people speak sometimes about a Nixon goes to China moment. The Nixon goes to China moment is not really an apt example because Nixon couldn't go to China, or he was able to go to China and then come back and still be president. Nobody said, well, we're pulling out of your coalition, you're not president anymore. So I don't think it's going to originate domestically within the current Israeli government. I do think it's in our own national security interests, and that to me is the single most important element. I think also it's in Israel's national security interest, but I think it is absolutely vital that the United States of America come to be viewed as a, a, a country that is insistent on justice on all sides, in peaceful resolution on all sides. And on this sense, I, I, I must interject. I was so thrilled to see these young Palestinian children play that concert for Holocaust survivors, and so disappointed that that orchestra has now been apparently disbanded. That business of not allowing humankind contact on either side is really a tragedy. 
on either side. And we, I think, as honest brokers, we, the United States, and our Congress and the administration, need to be uh, clear in purpose on all sides and not blinded by one side or the other and, and criticize openly and honestly and with integrity where we see criticism warranted and commend honestly and openly where we see praise warranted. So uh, with that, uh, I thank you for letting me join you and I look forward to the uh, comments of our colleagues here. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is that on? Thank you so much. We have time for one or two questions. I see one in the back. Please. Okay, good. Uh, it's a central question. I, I will say that when you look, this is my experience in the Congress, when you look at some of the resolutions that come before us, they're rather familiar in structure. Uh, and uh, many, many members of Congress who may vote for those resolutions will tell you privately that they wish the resolutions were, were more honest. And, and by, full, by honest, I mean fully honest. Not that the portion of the resolution is dishonest, but there's an entire side of the story left out. The, 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 the answer, you know, your opening remark is incredibly important. You know, you said as an American Jew, I think uh, if you listen to J Street's, uh, for example, their recent polling, uh, they will say that 70 uh, percent of, of American, uh, Jews in America, at least in their sample group, strongly believe that there should be U.S. engagement. And the challenge in the case of, of, of aid to Gaza is going to be that you can't get it there unless there is some form of a collaboration or cooperation, at least, between Hamas and the PA. And, and if we get hard over and say, we will not allow any help to go in unless uh, Hamas meets the three preconditions, you're not going to get there. And so a whole lot of people are going to be subject, continued subject to collective punishment, which I believe is what's happening in Gaza right now. I think it's collective punishment, and we need to call it for what it is, and we need to stop it for what it is. And so American people need to say, consistent with our own higher values, aid needs to get to people who are suffering, and we will work out the differences. Uh, I do not accept Hamas's rhetoric. And I think simultaneously, those who are sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, which I also count myself, a friend of Israel and a friend of the Palestinians, when we look at the roadmap for peace, I think we need to urge on that side that the, the Arab commitment is no longer just to rec uh, uh, diplomatic recognition, but I think the Arab countries need to combine together and say we will guarantee the existential security of the state of Israel. We're not just going to have you know, we'll give you a diplomat, we will guarantee the existential security of the state of Israel. That means we will not just have diplomats, but we will stop any forms of terror assistance, be it financial, military, training, etc. And importantly, we will overtly and directly combat uh, hate rhetoric, whether it's mosque, madrasa, or media, because that's got to happen at the same time. Those combinations, I think, both need to happen, but we have to, to get the aid there we have to allow some kind of cooperation. Probably through UNRWA would be the vehicle, but the God, Hamas is going to have to have a say in that probably at some, some level. Oh, okay. This gentleman. I'll work my way around. What is your view of accountability, holding uh, all parties involved in the conflict accountable for possible war crimes? 
Uh, I think there ought to be some investigations. I think Human Rights Watch is engaging in an investigation right now, and I think their report, I think, is due out April or May, and we should look at that and, and see what they have to say. I think there is a need for objective evaluation of the conduct on both sides. I mean, there are reports of abuses on, on Hamas within uh, Gaza, for example, and that needs to be investigated as well. This, gentleman, uh, this young lady in the front here with the scarf. Wait for the mic. I'm sorry, I'll, I don't know. Are we in video? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll repeat questions yeah. if people. Um, Congressman Baird, it's good to see you again. I was with you with Combatants for Peace last right. week, and, and um, it was well received. Um, I, you're mentioning a statement that you'd like to see Congress and the administration make on behalf of um, removal of settlements or non-expansion of settlements. The flip side of that issue is um, with regard to allowing villages to file building permits. And so, it's because it, settlements always expand onto private land. Um, Rebuilding Alliance, my group, built a kindergarten where the whole village is under demolition order, and we've been working through the court system to save it by bringing uh, the mayor to Congress to save it. But I think it's really important to um, be able to recognize and encourage that villages, like any other town, have the right to file their master plan and issue building permits, um, and, and I, I urge you to consider that. It's a good point. I, the reason I focus so much on the settlements is it's such a focal point for people's concern about, about the direction that things are going there. And so you start with that, and then you work from there. But I would start with that immediately, because I, I, I really believe there's a very narrow window of opportunity. You know, here we were traveling around Palestine and Gaza, and, and people are saying Barack Obama. Little children, Barack Obama, you know. <laughs> that was pretty cool. The kids knew who Barack Obama was. But there's a narrow window, and if, if it's just talk, one Palestinian leader said that when Mitchell came through, he said, I'm here to listen. And they said, fine, we'll talk. But next time you come, we'll be here to listen. Meaning, now you've heard our concerns, what are you going to do? And I think that's a pretty fair question after a lot of time of listening. And so this is a starting point to say, right now, it's, it's negotiations on real terms. Just as we've said all along, terrorism has to stop on the other side. We've also got to make sure some of the other conditions are met. This, I want to congratulate you uh, for speaking out on this issue, but I want to ask why, uh, if as you say, uh, many people in Congress understand that there's more than the side to this issue that is often passed in resolutions, why, uh, why don't you and others speak up, for example, about the unconditional military aid that we give to Israel every year, year in and year out, uh, when they are at the same time not only using the weaponry in violation of U.S. law, but uh, continuing the settlement process, which in theory is U.S. government uh, policy. Why isn't there any discussion of this? And my guess is if this issue were out in the open politically, the great majority of people in this country would not be in favor of giving $3 billion a year in arms aid to Israel. Well, I think, I think there is... I think it's worth discussing, and, and I personally believe that the conditions that I think President Obama either – one thing I think we have to be aware of is not all diplomacy is best carried out through public statements, but I think the message needs to go to the new government when it's finally formed, which is getting close to be in Israel, that that is a condition. Uh, I think we need to say these are some things, we steps towards the roadmap that we expect will be implemented, and if they're not implemented, then a series of of constraints will be imposed because it's, you just can't keep jawboning forever and have people say, thank you very much, we're going to do what we want. And military aid constraints might well be part of that package. I think you want to keep some flexibility about what that is, but uh, I think it does make sense to discuss that because clearly when I speak of U.S. security, there's no question that the people in the region recognize that at least a portion of the weapons were bought with U.S. military, uh, foreign military assistance, and some of the weapons are U.S. made. And so we do carry, whether we like to admit it or not, the rest of the world sees a certain moral culpability and practical uh, assistance in what has happened there. And that then makes us, gives us a moral responsibility to say, is this consistent with what we think is, first of all, in our own best interest, but secondly, in the best interest of what's going to happen in the region. I don't think what happened in Gaza is. I don't think the way the West Bank is being handled is in the best interest. The last thing on that front, there tends to be this dichotomy which is dangerous and false. The dichotomy is 
If you criticize what happened in Gaza, then you are condoning the rocketing of Sderot. I recall that dichotomy when it came to the Iraq war. It was, if you don't vote for the invasion of Iraq, then you somehow are condoning terrorism. There are a million different variations of things that could have been done in the interim and as an alternative to a full-scale uh, uh, aerial and ground assault in Gaza and as in Iraq. And I think we need to say, no, I emphatically do not condone the rocketing of people, civilians, but neither do I think this was justified in scale or in targeting, uh, and neither do I think it's in our security interests or that of Israel. And I think we have to do both of those. So I, I think more needs to be said about that. I will say, finally, the J Street data suggests, though, when you raise that, that then, the, 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 the very prospect of withholding any military financial aid raises the existential fear, which is quite understandable, of the Israeli people and of, of the American Jewish population who are so concerned, understandably, about existential threats from Iran and elsewhere. So the task is to, to somehow secure, affirm the security of the state of Israel without threatening the existential existence of it, but at the same time not condoning whatever Israel does. And that's a delicate task. I, th I think we really need to go on. But, um, so, so let's, let's... I'll stay and listen. Okay, okay, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Nancy Kanwisher. I'm here at MIT at the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department. Um, before introducing our speakers, I just want to take a brief moment to step back and consider the um, bigger picture of uh, why this topic is so important. Uh, and that is that it is a great deal is at stake in Gaza um, above and beyond the extraordinary suffering of the people who live there. First is Israel's international standing. Not that it was doing so great before, uh, but since the invasion of Gaza, um, Israel has, has been uh, widely condemned uh, by international uh, human rights organizations uh, in many different countries, um, is being accused of war crimes, uh, which will be discussed more at the panels tomorrow. Uh, and in what I think is a, an important new development is now finally um, uh, being widely criticized, even within the mainstream uh, U.S. media, uh, including John Stewart, um, uh, Roger Cohen of the New York Times in 60 Minutes, and that's, that's really new. So that's not good for Israel. Uh, second, um, also at stake um, are prospects for broader peace in the Middle East. So the invasion of Gaza has really uh, jeopardized peace talks between Israel and Syria, uh, and it has enraged millions of people around the world and heightened tensions in uh, a region of the world which is pretty much the most likely flashpoint for a truly major international conflict, and that's extremely dangerous, dangerous for everyone. Uh, and finally, as has just uh, come up a moment ago, um, the credibility of the Obama administration and of the U.S. in general um, is very much on the line in Gaza. So I think the U.S. is widely blamed for uh, Israel's behavior because we've done much to aid it and, um, and nothing much to stop it. And underlining that point, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, soon to be sworn in as Prime Minister of Israel, uh, was quoted in Haaretz last week uh, saying that he did not expect to come under pressure from the United States to make peace with his neighbors. Uh, speaking about U.S. pressure on Israel, he said, quote, I think you're talking about something that I doubt existed for any length of time in the past and which I am convinced does not exist today. Uh, well, sadly, I have to agree with him. Uh, the question is, Will things be any different uh, under Obama? So to think clearly about what can be done, the first step to do, to do is to understand how we got here. Uh, and to that end, we have uh, three distinguished panelists here today. So each of them will speak for 15 minutes, and then we will, after all the talks, um, turn it over to questions and dis discussion uh, from the audience. Nancy, if I, if I leave, it's okay. not a political commentary. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's to catch a flight. So if there's unfortunate okay, timing there, don't take it personally. Okay. We won't. <laughs> Um, so our first speaker is um, Gabriel Peterberg. He's a professor of history at UCLA. He teaches the history of the Ottoman Empire and the Mediterranean uh, in the uh, early modern period, um, and more modern uh, themes like Zionism, colonialism, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He's written several books, including An Ottoman Tragedy in 2006 um, and The Return of Zionism in 2008, and he also writes for New Left Review and the London Review of Books. Gabrielle. Uh, yes, please go ahead.
Well, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for organizing this uh, very important uh, <clears throat> conference uh, at these uh, not very pleasant times. And thanks for the introduction, Nancy. And I think uh, I owe to my uh, interest in writing on Ottoman history in the early modern period, I probably owe it my tenure, because if I had come up to tenure on the basis of my writing on Zionism, I would have been in big trouble. Um, I want to offer a wide historical background <clears throat> for within which, within, as a context within which uh, the carnage in Gaza uh, can be placed or should be placed in my view. And I want to do it in the shape or the metaphor I would use for my presentation is if you can imagine a perfectly calm pond and a pebble being thrown into it and then the circles that that entrance into the water creates, I will be moving in widening circles and accordingly widening historical perspective on the, um, on the Gaza event. Let me start with two concrete quotations. One is from what I think, from who I think, uh, is the greatest uh, Hebrew author from among those who were born in Palestine, Israel, and for whom Hebrew was a native tongue, as distinguished from um, those writers who had immigrated from Europe. Uh, his name was Izhar Smilansky, and he used the pen name S. Izhar, by which he's better known. In 1992, he published uh, an autobiography or an autobiographical novel called Mikdamot in Hebrew and Preliminaries in English. This was after 30 years of silence, of literary silence, and after uh, when he was in his mid-70s. Izhar was a member of the, what we could be called the Mayflower of the Zionist community. His parents were early settlers of the second Aliyah uh, who, who had come from Eastern Europe. He was born in one of the Moshavot or ethnic plantations, as Gershon Shafir has termed them, uh, to the southeast of Tel Aviv. Uh, he fought in the 48 war as an intelligence officer and wrote uh, what is one of the most important pieces, I think, in Hebrew literature in the history of the conflict, which is a, a novella on his war experience in 48 called Chilbet Hiza. At the end of uh, his masterful novel, I think it's the best thing he wrote, uh, Mikdamot or Preliminaries, one of the things he does is he ponders on the future of Zionism, but he does it in a sophisticated way because um, he is writing from the perspective of a child between the ages of uh, 2 to 12 uh, from 1916 when he was born till 1928 uh, when the novel ends and he died in 2006. But of course he does it with knowledge of the future. So his description of the past is historicist on the one hand, but it's impregnated with the future at the same time. And here is one of the passages that ends the novel when the child is sent in one of these ethnic plantations to help um, a vineyard owner uh, or a farmer to load the baskets of grapes and, 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 and transport them to where they have to be sent. Um, so here it is. But who really knows that it is so? No man here is a prophet, and even prophet would not know. A child might perhaps, with his unspoiled innocence, as though he has listened and heard and knows without any confirmation that the vineyard will not remain. But that even this boundary between the settled, between the settled land and the threatening silence of the dangerous mystery beyond will not remain. And these Arabs will not remain. The men and the women and that Zarnuga will not remain, and Kubeba will not remain, and Ibne will not remain. They will all go away and start living in Gaza. Woe for them. The second quotation is from the eulogy of Moshe Dayan, then chief of staff, uh, in 1956, uh, in the funeral of Roy Rottenberg from Kibbutz Nachal Oz. Kibbutz Nachal Oz was a settlement that was created by this mixture of military agricultural settlement, uh, settlements that was, were created in the 50s on the border of Gaza, and he was uh, in charge of security in that kibbutz. And uh, one night, infiltrators from Gaza, Fidain, uh, came through the border and attacked the kibbutz and killed him. 
And Moshe Dayan, who was then chief of staff, came and gave the eulogy, and I quote from that eulogy. How can we protest their strong hatred of us? For eight years now, remember he's giving it in 1956, for eight years now they have been dwelling in refugee camps in Gaza, and in front of their eyes we are transforming into a patrimony the land and villages on which they and their ancestors dwelt. Our life's choice to be prepared and armed, strong and tough, lest our feast would lose grip of the sword and our life would cease. So, the people of Gaza got to Gaza in 1948 as a result of the major showdown between the community of settlers in Palestine and the community of indigenous people. And as a result of which, of this war of 48, the community of indigenous people was shattered, destroyed, and expelled. And 80% of the inhabitants of Gaza uh, are people who had been uh, cleansed in 48 from areas from Tel Aviv to the south, say between Tel Aviv or to the southeast of Tel Aviv, all the way down to the western Negev Desert, from, from places like Abu Shusha, Mansura, Kubeba, Ibne, uh, Majdal, um, and so on and so forth. Now, having called this, and, and it's 80% of the 1.5 million people who uh, now live in Gaza are either the direct, or that they are diminishing, of course, because of biology it takes its course, or their offspring. Why do I call uh, the war of 48, because of which these people are in Gaza rather than in Palestine, a showdown between a settler, uh, the community of settlers, that had come into uh, statehood and the community of indigenous people. Because I think um, that the most appropriate way to view the Zionist colonization of Palestine and the state of Israel, and more generally the history of modern Palestine Israel, is within the framework of comparative settler colonialism. Scholarly awareness of settler colonialism as a distinct phenomenon is relatively recent. By distinct, it is meant that settler colonialism is distinguishable from metropole colonialism, for which British India is an obvious example. And that the various cases of settler colonialism from, from the 1580s onwards have enough in common to form a viable comparative field. By settler colonialism or nationalism, it is meant that the conquest of a territory by one of the European colonial powers was accompanied by settlers who gradually created a society distinguishable from the metropole and then sought to carve for themselves a national patrimony in that colony, and for which the model was usually European. The history of these colonies was underlain by the fateful triangle of indigenous people, metropole, settlers. The success of the latter of the settlers resulted in settler nation states like the US, like Argentina, like Canada, like Australia, like New Zealand, like South Africa, and like Israel. Whereas their failure could result in indigenous independence as happened in French Algeria and Kenya. The purpose of comparative settler colonialism is not to show that all settler societies were identical. On the contrary, Many of the studies within that field end up underscoring historical specificities. The comparative study of settler societies, however, furnish us with a language that makes it possible to identify the trajectory and structure of settler nations as a global phenomenon in modern history and to compare them. That language also constitutes an alternative to the hegemonic language of the settler nations themselves to the way they prefer to narrate and dominate. The alternative is, in my view, crucial not only intellectually, but also morally and politically. Throughout my work and uh, the book I published, which Nancy mentioned, um, I demonstrate that the adequacy of the framework of comparative settler nationalism is not limited to such issues as land, labor, and political institutions, but it, it extends to themes like consciousness, literary imagination, knowledge, and foundational myths, and the use of the Old Testament. Now, let me quote, before I move to Palestine specifically for a few minutes, one uh, important intervention from someone who is, in my view, perhaps the most, in recent years, the most insightful uh, and original 
writer on settler colonialism, Patrick Wolf, who is, a, uh, believe it or not, an Irish Jewish scholar uh, based in Australia and writing on Australia, but also comparing Australia to other cases of settler colonialism. And he says, I quote him, settler colonies were, are, premised on the elimination of the native societies. The split tensing reflects a determinate feature of settler colonization. The colonizers come to stay. Invasion is a structure, not an event. And that's why I think the, this framework of settler colonialism is so important, because it doesn't disappear with the original moment of colonization. It continues to underlie the nation state if the settlers are successful, which they are in Israel. Now, having set the general picture, let me say something about the uniqueness. I mean, there are many points of uniqueness, and as I said, the purpose of this comparative framework is not to say that all these cases are the same. Let me say what I think is uh, unique. Thank you. Uh, this is the best I've seen so far, rather than these ridiculous pieces of paper that... Uh, <laughs> this is, um, um, let, I think the, the uniqueness that I want to stress now, so it's not the only feature that, that is historically specific to Palestine, is that the Israel-Palestine case is one in which there's a settler situation which has remained unresolved. What do I mean by unresolved? If we put aside uh, moral uh, ethics and human emotions, let's look at it cold-bloodedly. The resolved cases of settler colonialism, which are no longer a political problem as such, are either when the settlers were so successful that they simply eliminated the indigenous population, like in the US, like in Canada, like in Australia, like in Argentina, in which there is no political struggle between settlers and indigenous people because there are no indigenous people to speak of as a political uh, element uh, that contests the domination and triumph of the settlers. There is another possible resolution, which is that the settlers were unable to impose themselves, to assert themselves and create their own nation state, and for a variety of reasons, did A, did not drive out the metropole uh, uh, empire, whether Britain or France, these are, these are the main examples, and were not able to establish their own nation state. In these cases, which are fewer in number, they had to leave. Um, which were the cases of French, Algeria, and Kenya mainly, but there are others like eventually uh, Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. The uniqueness of Palestine is that the settlers won. They won big time, and they have become more powerful exponentially with time. And the main showdown in 48 ended in their huge victory over not only their neighboring states, which is well known, but also over the indigenous population, which they shattered and uh, comple almost completely, but the emphasis is on almost, um, that they established their own nation state and their power has been growing exponentially relative to the indigenous community, but they have been unable to eradicate it completely. They have been unable to remove it completely. And I think what we are seeing is the increasing violence and wanton destruction, which I could detail, but I won't because there's not enough time, by the settler nation state, because this situation is not static, it's dynamic. This frustration of, on the one hand, being so powerful, but on the other, the indigenous people not only existing, however uh, pathetically, however weakly, however unable to resist, effectively, they are still there and the numbers are growing. And this tension, this impossibility at the end to um, effect a resolution which ends in complete settler victory creates an exponentially growing level of violence. I think the settlers won. Clearly Israel is very powerful, exponentially more powerful than the, Palest than the Palestinians. And they can do neither of, one th of, of, of two things. They cannot remove them irrevocably because what could be done in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries can, can no longer, and in the first half of the 20th century, if we remember, 
uh, the Holocaust, of course, can no longer be done now. At the same time, because they are so much more powerful, they cannot bring themselves, they cannot resign to the existence of the indigenous community as a community of equal human beings. And in order to reach whatever state, whatever frame of, of, of political solution, one state, two states, federation, binationalism, whatever you want, there has to be a recognition and a resignation by the settler community and now the settler nation state that the other, the indigenous community, is a community of equal human beings. And I shall end with something that uh, Amira Haas uh, once told me, the great Haaretz correspondent. She told me that, um, well, she told me two things. One was that she knew, of course, being one of the most perceptive people on the Arab-Israeli or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, that she knew from the outset that the Oslo process was disingenuous on the side of Israel. What she didn't know and what surprised her was how easily corruptible the PLO leadership was. This was one thing she said, and I still carry with me. The other thing she said was that the reason Israel was so fearful of a, a, an agreement that after all was very advantageous to itself is the worry, the fear, the anxiety, which is sometimes unselfconscious, that even this, if we want to be kind, which probably we shouldn't, this two-state solution would create the beginning of some sort of parity, of some sort of, of equality in the sense that the community of indigenous people would gain a similar status as that of the settlers. And this is something that Israeli society, polity, and state, as we are seeing now in these elections, has not been able to bring itself to accept. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Um, hold, hold your questions. You'll have a chance to ask them in a little bit. But uh, we'll, we'll next go on to Irene Genzier. Uh, Irene, if you don't mind speaking from the podium, that'd be great. She's a professor uh, in the Department of Political Science at Boston University. And she writes on US foreign policy in the Middle East, as well as problems of development. She co-edited Crimes of War, Iraq, with Richard Falk and Robert J. Lifton. Uh, and she's author of Notes from the Minefield, U.S. Intervention in Lebanon in the Middle East, 1945 to 1958. And she's currently at work uh, on a book uh, and an examination of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, 1945 to 49, uh, to be titled Dying to Forget. Irene? Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing this. Uh, let me begin by saying that I know, not only feel inadequate to the task, I have a sense of utter unreality that seems increasingly to come over me when I participate in such events. Here we are in beautiful MIT at the center, which has a long history um, that I'd rather not remember, but is a new center now. Nonetheless, we are here with the liberty of uh, speaking about, in whatever way we wish, the terrible events that are the subject of this conference and then leaving for the evening or the day or the next day. And I ask myself, and I say this about myself and not any of the others speaking, what have we contributed? What have I contributed? What can we contribute? I have to say, contrary to um, some of the important things that Congressman Baird had to say, the existential question that he identifies as being especially keen for Israelis, I think is especially keen for humanity, for the Palestinian and Arab humanity that is also very deeply existentially threatened uh, and at a loss. My comments are going to be very few and about different aspects of US policy. And my concern is really quite specifically both to say something about the nature of U.S. policy, but I think more important, and here I would very much like to have your, your views, I think that the, the only important thing that we can do is to try to inform public opinion, because the level of ignorance that continues in spite of all the changes that have been mentioned is very powerful. 
the level is very profound. I feel it at the university, and uh, I'm sure that many of you do in uh, whatever walks of life you find yourself in. This is our challenge. It is much more pervasive and changing policy, but it is perhaps something that we can do that will ultimately affect policy. Uh, the administration uh, should have informed us that it created a new department when it uh, was inaugurated. I call it DOS.1. That's to distinguish it from the Department of State. It's the Department of Silence. And uh, it's been one of the very successful ones. And as you understand, its function is largely to direct the president and high officials and their subordinates about what not to say and indeed what not to respond to. Um, and it's been really uh, remarkably successful because on this issue that we're speaking here about today, the, the silence has been, I would say, uh, overwhelming. The administration now is preoccupied with Afghanistan. It's preoccupied with Pakistan. Uh, Iraq, as far as it's concerned, is, al it's concerned, is already uh, at a uh, secondary level. It's considering, of course, openings to Syria and openings to Iran, and I assume that the interest in those openings uh, has to do with uh, trying to undermine their respective relations with Hezbollah and with Hamas, and uh, in general working out the, uh, the dominant view in Washington that those organizations are really nothing more than uh, the uh, agents of these uh, larger and more powerful governments. Uh, on the other hand, the U.S. military, if you judge by some of their recent writings, I'm thinking of um, something published by the Strategic Studies Institute uh, that's funded by the U.S. Army War College in September 2008. The concern is uh, something related, but a little bit uh, uh, different. The concern is uh, the implications, for example, of the 2006 Israeli uh, campaign in uh, Lebanon. Uh, the concern is specifically the implications, the political and the military implications for the U.S. I quote, the 2006 conflict is an example of, quote, the role of non-state opponents in defense planning. It's widely believed that such enemies will be increasingly common in the future, and many now advocate sweeping change in U.S. military posture to prepare for this. Hezbollah's campaign offers, quote, a window into a kind of warfare that is increasingly central to U.S. defense planning, end quote. I would be very surprised if events in Gaza uh, are not now considered as part of that larger study. Um, and uh, as part of that, the use of weapons in uh, dense urban areas becomes uh, uh, an extremely interesting and compelling subject. Uh, this is a perspective in which I think Gaza and the events of Gaza uh, are placed, or rather are not placed. They have appeared in a footnote. The only thing that went wrong and that perhaps wasn't anticipated was not the number of people killed, it wasn't those who were injured. It wasn't the percentage of children. It wasn't even the level of, dis of destruction that Congressman Baird identified. It was something else. It became public. Between Jazeera, the Internet, Palestinian correspondence, Arab correspondence, European correspondence, it became impossible not to know Looking at Israeli sources, the articles that have appeared in Haaretz, the position of the Israeli attorneys for the military, the soldiers' war talk, the accounts of what occurred, it's impossible to turn away and say, oh, we didn't know. Sorry, we didn't know. I imagine that even those in Washington who are very interested in not knowing must know that some know, and therefore this has escalated into a global problem of dimensions that are maybe unprecedented. Alleged war crimes surely have occurred and war crimes have surely occurred in other places. As I say, the numbers may, be, may have been greater. 
the fundamental question, the central axiom, which is the inability, or the, not the inability, the reluctance to face the single fact, not settlements, occupation, is the problem in the throat of Washington policymakers. And that's the problem that I think that we need to address. But my point is that unexpectedly, because of the factors that I just mentioned, the world changed. Uh, the weapons of mass destruction, which we are specialists in and which we uh, mainly use for export, have a second la layer that's weapons of mass deception. Uh, they're used for domestic purposes. Those weapons are breaking down exactly for the same reasons, because this information is now in front of us. And I suppose that those of you who are here in the same way that I'm here for, for precisely this reason now need, we feel that we must confront what it is that we have seen um, and act on it. Uh, in spite of all the limitations within the U.S., there still has been a level of public outrage a level of activity, not reported necessarily in the press, but reported uh, across the internet, that's really been impressive. It has been, and again, I would say it's been unprecedented in the rapidity with which, with which it occurred. Insofar as the U.S. is concerned, just to backtrack very, very briefly, uh, U.S. political and military complicity with Israel is, is part of the record. Uh, there is a tacit un, an explicit and a tacit understanding uh, on the part of the U.S. that uh, Israel was right in trying to undermine the 2006 Hamas election. Uh, after all, it was U.S. trained Fatah forces in the West Bank who were uh, employed in uh, trying to do that, in trying to uh, correct that situation, if you know what I mean. And when that failed, the blockade that followed, the rockets that followed, and the, and the uh, Israeli reaction came as, as no surprise. The U.S. did not respond to the Israeli siege. It didn't respond in spite of everything that was known about it. And uh, uh, at the same time, its military support uh, continued and is part of the record. And I want to say something briefly about, uh, about that. Since 2002, during the Bush administration, Israel received over 21 billion U.S. military and security assistance. And I respect the question that was asked in the back about the need for addressing this and the reasons why that is so seldom done. That included $19 billion in direct military aid under the Pentagon's foreign military financing program. Put simply, Israel's military intervention in the Gaza Strip has been equipped to a large extent by U.S. supplied weapons, munitions, and military equipment paid with U.S. Uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, this is a, an Amnesty International report that I'm citing. On uh, <clears throat> August 16th, going back, well, let me, all, uh, let me note the following. Uh, According to Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act, quote, no security assistance may be provided to any country, the government of which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, end quote. Just bear that, uh, bear that in mind. And Section 4, however, of the Arms Export Control Act also authorizes supply of U.S. military equipment and, and participation in U.S peacekeeping operations or other operations. However, under the U.S. Export Administration Act, security may be provided, in spite of all the constraints identified, if the president certifies that extraordinary circumstances exist, hence that loophole. Um, on August 16, 2007, the U.S. and Israeli government signed a 10-year accord for the provision of $30 billion in U.S. military aid that includes a new generation of F-35 fighter jets, advanced bombs, laser-guided missiles coming to about $3 billion per year, as was mentioned here. And that, in turn, represents a 25 percent increase of the U.S. annual military and appropriation to Israel of $2.4 billion. Uh, Israel is the largest recipient in the world of U.S. military aid. Since 2004, U.S. taxpayers have also paid to supply 500 million gallons of refined oil. <clears throat> it's about, uh, worth about $1.1 billion to the Israeli military. And according to the Freedom of Information Act, between 2004 and 2007, the Department of Defense gave 
$818 million worth of fuel to the Israeli military. In 2008, an additional $280 million in fuel was given. In other words, and the U.S. is paying for the shipping. So the fuel for this war also comes from the U.S. And you may be interested to know, although there, was, there has been some, but not nearly enough, attention paid to a minor discovery that may be a major discovery, natural gas, offshore natural gas, off the coast of Gaza. That has been a source of enormous interest, and one may surmise where, where that would lead. So I want to add perhaps just two other things. The first is that in the discussion of the illegality of U.S. action, <clears throat> or the questioning of the legality of the U.S. action, attention is always paid to the question of whether or not alternatives existed for Israel and therefore for the U.S. and its support. And we know the answer to that is yes. I won't dwell on it now. Suffice to say that the answer lies <coughs> in the position of Hamas in Khaled Mashal's indication and agreement to accept solution to the conflict on the basis of the 67 borders. I'll come back to that later. That has been carried in Haaretz as well as in the Daily Star. What makes Gaza different, and I want to uh, to come back to this and in a way to, to end with this, is exactly what I said before. Because of what we have seen, I believe that we are witnessing the public beheading of Israeli myths that have confirmed what Palestinians, what Arabs, what international sources, and what many Israelis have long been telling us and certainly have told us with respect to the struggle over Gaza. Why is it important that we here confront this? Because we haven't done so in the past. And by we, I mean not simply the Congress. The Congress is accessible and inaccessible, as we know, for, for many reasons. But on a popular basis, uh, deception has played such an important role in uh, uh, enabling our foreign policy. Uh, we know that with respect to Iraq, we know what the uh, lies about weapons of mass destruction were about. Why cannot we turn that page uh, with respect to Israel and investigate exactly those issues uh, um, on this sorry subject? Two last points. In 1948, when the U.S. had a very, in part, a very different view of developments, um, that uh, were occurring in Palestine. That is to say, the evidence coming in from uh, U.S. representatives in, uh, throughout Palestine were coming in to the State Department and ultimately to the White House were very clear on the expulsions, on the flights, the expulsions of Palestinians, on their conditions, on the positions of Israelis, on the intentions of Israelis as they were heard and expressed no matter how incompletely, the position of the U.S. government, including Truman at the time, was, I would say, uh, panic, uh, sense of uh, being appalled, uh, instant uh, committees created uh, with the purpose of coming up with some numbers, some solutions, some demands, 100,000 Palestinians to be allowed to be repatriated. That subject of the refugees was not hidden, it wasn't uh, uh, deleted, it would be very, very soon, but for a time it was not. It was openly discussed uh, between the CIA, the State Department, and, uh, and the Pentagon. Uh, but the feeling was, this is my conclusion, uh, the uh, sources, by the way, are available uh, right here in Cambridge that I'm consulting, the U.S. sources uh, available to anyone. My conclusion is that those who differed in their outlook, uh, felt that, uh, wait a minute, the extraordinary achievement, in quotes, of the new Israeli government, namely that it was able to expand beyond the territory allot allotted to it in the 1947 UN partition resolution, uh, that it was able to expand without effective resistance, either from within the Middle East or outside, was something to be taken very seriously. In other words, it passed. And uh, what that proved was two things. First, the uh, cohere political coherence and military capacity of the Israelis, but also 
for very different historical reasons since 1948 that are um, obvious, uh, there was no public outcry that mattered to Washington. In 1975, um, the um, U.S. government printing office issued a an interesting booklet called Oil Fields as Military Objectives, a feasibility study. Uh, it re reads like ancient history now, but in uh, its assessment of what to be concerned about, international law, for example, is one, but another one is public opinion. And uh, here there are just two things that I want to quote. Uh, the question that's asked in 75, this is following the uh, 73 war, the U.S. is very concerned about the future of its oil interests, is considering the possibility of intervention, and is canvassing all sides and um, is discussing the following. World public opinion is rarely pervasive. Most often it reflects reactions by the masters rather than the masses of states that share common interests at specific interests. Neither does world public opinion exert persistent pressures. And the examples given, the Soviet savaging of Czechoslovakia that caused so much commotion was quickly forgotten. But the principles, by all but the principles, and some cynics exaggerating to emphasize the point, size, cite about six weeks or so as the limit of sustained emotion by observers as opposed to participants. On the other hand, and uh, I'll end with this reference, Moods in America, this is written uh, in 75, Moods in America could be more important. Perhaps the most pointed lesson U.S. leaders learned in Vietnam was that national decisions, however desirable they may otherwise seem, must be acceptable to the people. Thank you. Thanks very much, Irene. Uh, and, and again, hold your questions. We'll get to questions after the, uh, the third speaker, um, which is Carmen Abolsi. You can go up to the podium. Um, you can, but for recording purposes, they prefer you stand up there. So if you don't mind, that'd be better. Um, so Karma is a fellow in politics uh, at St. Edmund Hall and university lecturer in international relations at Oxford University. She's author of Traditions uh, of War, Occupation, Resistance, and the Law, published in 1999, Palestinian, uh, Palestinians Register, Laying Foundations and Setting Directions in 2006, and numerous scholarly articles and chapters on the philosophy of war, uh, European political history, and Palestinian refugees and representation. Karma. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the organizers. Here's Nitin and Hillary and the others from MIT. I, I, I was very, I'm very glad to speak today after my uh, distinguished colleagues because they made my task a lot easier. Uh, Gabby for throwing in that huge pebble which explains the history going back generations of the settler colonial project and Irene for discussing the involvement, uh, whether most Americans know of it or not, of uh, this administration as well as previous administrations on creating what we have today. I'd like to just explain a little bit from the Palestinian side of how we see how we got here because that's the focus of today's panel. And I would like to uh, talk about the other side of this narrative that uh, my friends have, have outlined above because, of course, the settler colonial project, which continues today, was about expulsion and fragmentation. The Palestinian story is also and primarily one about resistance to this project. And what we have today in Gaza is the outcome of the attempt to annihilate Palestinian resistance and Palestinian representation. Uh, this, has been, uh, this is the thing that, of course, concerns me above all, 
because uh, in, in speaking at a place like MIT, speaking in a place like America, where some basic tenets of what does it mean to be a free people, it means, of course, to represent yourself. Yeah? And the Palestinian quest to seek representation and to represent our issues and to keep presenting our basic claims to freedom, to liberation, above all, to return. Yeah? Uh, Gabby and both Gabby and Irene talked about the issue of 48 and the expulsion and that that is for us the key issue of representation. The Palestinian movement began not out of a resistance to military occupation in 1967. The Palestinian movement of resistance and representation began quite simply as a movement of return. And it was a very simple uh, quest, which is the core of the issue for all Palestinians, whether refugee or not, which is to restore the body politic, to allow those who were expelled and thrown out of their homes, not only the villages and farms, but from the cities as well, to be allowed to return. And it's a basic cornerstone of international law. So I would define what's happening in Gaza and with Hamas as the same struggle, the same issue, time and time again, generation after generation, and it's about an attempt to deny us our representation and an attempt to destroy our resistance. Uh, the election of Hamas in 2006 is where many people saw a turning point in Gaza, but it was a continuation of a policy. Uh, the issues that uh, I'd like to bring you back to 2006 and look at what were the issues that Hamas ran its campaign on. And that's something quite important. The year before that, uh, 2005, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, ran for the presidency of the Palestinian Authority. And this was after the death of Arafat. And if you remember, Arafat had been under, what, a two and a half year siege? in his headquarters in Ramallah for very much the same kind of issues that are facing Hamas today. Yeah. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas was elected on a vast uh, popular uh, landslide and his position was much different from Arafat's. His position was that we are going to, as, a, as Fatah, as a political party, and as a president who will lead the negotiations, we are going to entirely rely upon the goodwill of the Israeli government and of the U.S. administration in order to achieve our rights, in order to raise the issues that concern us, and in order to get a peaceful settlement. Uh, if any of you remember what happened during that year, Sharon was in power, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president, received absolutely nothing, and not only that, was humiliated and uh, treated with contempt by the Israeli administration, so much so that you had many uh, Israelis on the center saying, we have to do something to help Mahmoud Abbas, because how can we keep him in power? He is the president that we've all been waiting for. He is the one that everybody can deal with because no one could deal with Arafat because he suddenly proved that he had some red lines so now we have President Abu Mazen that everyone has said, this is the Israeli choice, this is the American choice, and we've given him nothing. Now, Hamas uh, did not run a campaign on an Islamic ideology or social program. Hamas ran a campaign that exactly mirrored Fatah's national program of five years before. On Jerusalem, on all of the issues that concern Palestinians, that are important to us, that represent us, on the refugees, on Jerusalem, on our prisoners. In fact, on all of these issues, Hamas presented in its election platform the consensual national position on all of those issues. The mainstream secular party had stopped speaking about these issues even. No one from Fatah or the other parties talked about the refugees. Nobody talked about our prisoners. 
So there was no representation. The, what had happened and what continues to happen is a constant pressure to co-opt leadership. You could see the attempt now with Hamas of trying to do that as well, to stop us talking about the things that we need representation on, on the occupation, on the expulsion of the refugees, on our prisoners, 11,000 people in prison. Yeah. These are the things that matter to us, and these are the things on which we seek representation. Unsurprisingly, after polling about, I don't know, anything from 17 to 20 percent, Hamas won 43 percent. Yeah, it leapt up in the polls because it represented Palestinian concerns. So this attempt, you know, whenever there's an election, whenever there's an opportunity, whenever there's a chance for Palestinians to assert their rights and their wills, they will take it. I don't think I've met a single person that voted for Hamas that is a Hamas supporter. I've talked to so many people that voted for Hamas in that election. They weren't seeking to achieve an Islamic state in the West Bank and Gaza. And we all, we forget that, that Hamas was elected in the West Bank as well as in Gaza. It was for the Palestine Legislative Committee and they uh, council, and they won both in the West Bank and Gaza, more of the seats in Gaza but in the West Bank, but we have elected representatives from Hamas in the West Bank as well, many of them in prison now. So this party, Hamas, held the Palestinian national consensus when it won. Now, that was the moment when Fatah was thrown out of power. Now, two things could have happened. What happens in a democracy when a party is thrown out of power, when people are, you know, everybody was so upset, not only with the, with the corruption on the, on the financial level, but on the political corruption, on the corruption that has happened when a leadership stops representing their people. Yeah? Two things could have happened. First, they could have been thrown out of power by the people's will, and they could have gone about trying to represent their people again, to start to listen to them again, to start to, you know, there's always the, the normal issue of leadership and representation. You cannot lead a people unless you represent them. First, you must represent your people before you can lead them. Yeah? The other thing, which is what happened, is the American administration told them, Fatah, that you did not lose the election. You are still in power. And we are going to keep arming and funding and keeping you propped up. Yeah? And so what happened was a refusal to allow representation. And that is what has been happening ever since then. You, you know, we call it the Dayton Sulta, the Dayton Authority. Yeah? The way that there has been an attempt constantly by this U.S. administration to engineer, to co-opt, to prevent these issues. These are the issues that need to be resolved, dealt with, addressed. Yeah? Um, I'd like to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I won't take much longer actually. I'd like to, you know, so the complex steps that led us here today are largely the outcome of the deliberate policies of not only the belligerent occupying power, but the United States administration, who keep attempting to choose our representation for us on the Palestinian side. Uh, and, and although I've just talked about the last three years of this policy, you can see it in the design of the Oslo agreements, which was a huge de-democratization process which disenfranchised the Palestinians from their own representation. I don't have time to go into that now, but what I'd like to just do is, is, is read two, the two first points of an important document that if anybody wants to know what is the issues that the Palestinians care, you know, are united on, what binds us, what do we want, what are the things that we need here in this country for people to be speaking up on our behalf to allow our representation? I'd like to just mention the first two points of something that's called the prisoner's document. 
that was written across the parties by the leadership inside the prisons. And that included all of the parties, including Islamic Jihad. I think they had a reservation on one of the points, but it was about negotiation, so it wasn't important. But it's the two key things that unites us, and that is something about allowing our representation that is important. The first point was a pr point on principles that unites us, and the second is on the mechanisms that we need to achieve those principles. So I'd like to read these two points of the prisoner's document. You can find it online, and, and um, it's the basis for our national unity. The first, first point of the prisoner's document says, the Palestinian people in the homeland and in the diaspora seek to liberate their land and to achieve their right in freedom, return, and independence, and to exercise their right in self-determination, including the right to establish an independent state with Jerusalem, Al-Quds al-Sharif, as its capital on all territories occupied in 1967, and to secure the right of return for refugees, and to liberate all prisoners and detainees based on the historical right of our people on the land of the fathers and grandfathers, based on the UN Charter, international law, and international legitimacy. The second point is the point about the national unity and the mechanisms to achieve that, and that is to work on achieving what has been agreed in Cairo in 2005 pertaining to the development and activation of the Palestine Liberation Organization and joining of Hamas and Islamic Jihad movements to the PLO, which is the legitimate and sole representative of the Palestinian people wherever they are located, and in a matter that meets on the changes in the Palestinian arena according to democratic principles and to consolidate the fact that the PLO is the legitimate and sole representative of the Palestinian people. Yeah. And it goes on to talk about new elections to the Palestine National Council, which is our parliament, before the end of 2006, this was 2006, that secures the representation of all Palestinians wherever they are in all of the constituencies. Now, I was just in Gaza last month, and the thing that, besides the huge, huge collective and psychological trauma that people are suffering there now, and I think that's one of the most important things, is to acknowledge not only the individual uh, grief that people are suffering, most everybody that I know there and saw there and talked to there and met there has either been the victim of or witnessed a war crime among their family and friends. And this is something that no amount of development aid, assistance moving forward can address. The, the thing that needs to be addressed is what's happened to the people there. They need to have that dealt with in a respectful way, not as individuals, but as a community, as a political community. To be able to say our representative is Hamas, whether we like them or not, the, the fact that we have the right to vote for who we want to vote for the fact that we want to vote for representative leaderships yeah, is the most essential human capacity and ability and right that we have wherever we are. Yeah. So for the people of Gaza, as the people for the West Bank, as for the people in Lebanon, the right to be political agents, to be human beings, to be citizens and to be treated as such is really what is what Palestinians today are fighting for, above all. Yeah? Um, I'd like to close with, uh, I had a, fr a friend of mine, you know, we're looking at Gaza, and for me it's a kind of prototype of what's been happening for the longest time. Yeah? People look at Gaza and the siege and what's been happening and the refusal to allow glass in, to rebuild, even to, put, to fix the windows. All the windows are broken in Gaza and went through this freezing winter. Yeah, everything, everything is banned. Everything's, everything's under siege and stifling. So when you look at siege and you look at what is the purpose of siege, it's to break a people's will. It's to break a people's will. And it's about trying to break a people's will to resist. Yeah? But... I'd like to talk about, there was a, fr a friend of mine was killed last week in uh, Lebanon, Kamal Madhat, and he was working very hard on national unity. And, he, you know, if you look at the situation of the Palestinians in Lebanon, you know, we all look at Gaza, and we look at this year and a half, two years of siege, and how distorting and how criminal 
it is. But it's directly connected to the predicament of the Palestinians in Lebanon who have been through 20, over 20 years of the same type of siege. Yeah? The Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are as equally in extremis as the Palestinians in Gaza. And so, although I know this, it's important that the conference is on Gaza because the policies of today are focused on breaking Gaza, we must not forget that this is about the Palestinian people as a whole and that the attempt to fragment the Palestinian people as a whole is what we have to always look at correcting and addressing and supporting their right for unity and independence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karma. We have time for questions now. I think your hand went up first in the pink. Uh, and we want to get the microphone. Over here. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all the speakers for this wonderful presentation. And my only regret is that the senator wasn't here to hear you. Um, my question is for all of you. I have come across Khirbet Khiza recently, Mr. Peterberg, in uh, an article by Elias Khouri, a Lebanese writer in the Nahar newspaper where he went back to basically figure out what drives Israelis to uh, carry out that kind of uh, ethnic cleansing and, and destruction of Palestinian life. And I wonder as a Palestinian who's been uh, working as an activist for so many years, uh, if there's any way to really address the situation and to uh, come up with a resolution to this um, to the oppression of the Palestinians, I hate the word conflict, but as people like to call it a conflict, without addressing Israel as a racist state uh, uh, that is based on Zionism, which is uh, an ideology that uh, promotes ethnic discrimination, which according to UN definitions is racism. And uh, if we do not start working from that platform, if we will ever reach a conclusion to this um, tragedy. Thank you. Um, yes, I think you said to all three, but uh, let me first say that um, there is a new translation of the entire novella, Khirbat Hiza, uh, with a very important afterword by David Shulman, who is not only a, a world renowned uh, professor of Sanskrit and uh, ancient Indian languages, but also an activist of Taish, of uh, uh, that important organization in, in Palestine, and that, if I may say modestly, since uh, Izhar died in 06, several of his uh, works have been translated into English. Some of, uh, uh, all three of them, uh, 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 sorry, the two main uh, ones by Nicolas Delange, who used to translate Amos Oz and has now moved into translating good literature. Um, and um, if I may modestly say, I've written a piece for the London Review of Books recently on, that, on, on these translated uh, works into English by, uh, uh, by Zahar, whom, uh, whom I like a lot. Um, I think one important thing is and it, it's been said in a different way by Irene and, and by Karma, is to tell the stories and to tell them and retell them and re-retell them. And it, it, it is, although it is a story of the past and it can be told through literature, it can be told through, histori through, through history, it can be told through sociology, um, I think this is part of the creating a truthful, honest, uh, picture of the past is absolutely essential for the politics of the present. I truly think that this is, this is very important. I think it is important to, again, part of the process, to understand what Zionism is as an ideology, as a movement, and as a project of settler colonialism. I think, again, it is no uh, proper understanding of the history of Palestine since the 1880s until today is possible without that. And I think, therefore, no proper political awareness of the present uh, can be achieved without it. I think I would 
just add a cautionary note, which is, it is very easy because it, the, the, it's so easy to uh, deteriorate into incendiary discussion that one has to be, if one wants to somehow reach uh, a political resolution by nonviolent means, and certainly I'm one of them, of those people, there's a point beyond which, which is very fine and very delicate. Um, the truthful and honest and uninhibited analysis and interpretation of Zionism as a settler colonial project, which is after all what I've done, is one thing, and the deterioration into uh, language, emotions, rhetorical discourse that creates uh, antagonism and alienation and really stifles civil discussion is lurking behind the door. And I think one has to be very careful not to do that. And uh, I know that through my teaching, uh, I don't compromise on what I say, but I'm always careful. You see, if, again, I'm, I, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a trial and error uh, process whereby, as I say, to analyze this as it should be analyzed as a settler colonial project and is one thing when it deteriorates into Zionism equal racism equals fascism, and sometimes people, some people say un, 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 unjustly, I think, equals Nazism, and it's the same, and so on and so forth. This creates an atmosphere, a framework within which serious, painful political discussion becomes impossible. So I think I agree with you. I think Zionism should be analyzed precisely in that way. But with this cautionary remark in, or, or, or warning in mind all the time, it's very easy to move from that to exchanging curses and uh, bad-mouthing and so forth, which, which doesn't get us anywhere. This is not going to be a direct uh, reply to, to your question, but your question reminds me of something. Can you hear? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, something that. Uh, okay. One of the things that we have to deal with here, I was struck by it because I was uh, reading a book by U.S. military on the on the condition of the U.S. military, and the book is specifically uh, has a cheerful title on killing, uh, the psychological cost of learning to kill in war and society. Uh, one of the things this author points out, and we know it, we know it instinctively, we know it intellectually, it's a, and it is essential to what I call the deception project, you have to be able to dehumanize the subject that you are dealing with. You have to reduce that subject to some inhuman object. You have to develop an emotional distance that allows you to do exactly as the Israeli soldiers in that article, in, in their revelations, in, in how it's explained, when they said, it's cool, you can do in Gaza whatever you want, it's cool. And those who thought otherwise were, were in a minority. But uh, I'm very loath to be very critical of someone else knowing what our own history in this country has been. Uh, we, we don't get uh, uh, an A. For, for this. So I think that uh, this is what I would, I would like to concentrate on, exposing this. There's something else, just on the level of sheer information. Uh, I'm struck, uh, as somebody who lives within the university, that we have an immense amount of material information available to us. On every side, every angle, you can find out what somebody in uh, Tbilisi is thinking of this situation in Gaza. But who reads it? Uh, who actually uh, sits down and considers it. Uh, I have students uh, whom I think the world of. They're extraordinary. And I've, uh, we've had very uh, interesting talks at BU in a recent law forum. And I met with some of those who uh, uh, organized that meeting. And some of them said, frankly, they didn't know very much about Gaza to begin with. And they knew very little about Gaza afterwards. What they meant was, all that we assume, uh, we take as a first step why we're here, because we have been witness or know about these events that are almost unmentionable, 
they were not so sure about were they unmentionable and why and so on. So I was shocked by this and they were shocked by me and I said, okay, well, wait a minute, we have to start from the beginning. They say, yes, that's what we want. I thought we were beyond that. In other words, there's a level of, uh, I don't think it's a deliberate disinformation, but there is a media, academia, cultural uh, degeneration, I would say, on the subject of uh, the Middle East, the East, uh, the Orient, all of this stuff. You probably can get more information about what's happening in Israel from the Arab press than you can from the U.S. press. I mean coverage, let's say, of what's happening, uh, of, what, of what appears in, in Haaretz which uh, very few people would be able to, to manage to get published. And it's not only Amira Hassan, Gideon Levy, there are a few others. <clears throat> so I think <clears throat> uh, this, is <clears throat> this was not exactly your question, but I think that it contributes to the, to the real problem that you describe. Thank you. Yeah. Could you just go over the question again? Just, could you just repeat? Repeat the, my question? Yeah. From, okay. Like in, concisely or? Yeah, just, just a everything? summary of it. I just want to make sure that okay. I answer it. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is that it, it's more of a commentary more than a question. I mean, I do believe that we're not going to get anywhere forward with uh -huh. resolving this problem and with liberating Palestinians and with, um, um, bringing justice to all parties involved without addressing Zionism as an ideology that ethnically discriminates mm -hmm. against Palestinians. As an ethnic group, we are being discriminated against, and we are, as um, one of the speakers indicated, a stumbling block in front of this colonial project, and therefore we're dispensable. Mm -hmm. So if we do not address that as the root cause of the problem and as a thing that needs to be, frankly, eradicated, Zionism as a movement, in my opinion, needs to be uh, addressed as such. And uh, I don't think it's incendiary or going too far by calling Zionism a, a racist ideology. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 okay. I'm not a, a, a big scholar of Zionism in terms of the spiritual Zionism and, 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 and Jewish identity and, and what have you, but I see it from a point of view of a Palestinian and, and its enactment okay. in Palestine from day one as the novel that uh, the, you have indicated, which I've read recently too, uh, indicates from day okay. one it's been an uh, ethnically discriminatory movement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just, you know, Gabby, Gabby was talking about, you know, emotions and being free of emotions. I think that actually sentiment is integral to this issue in one way. I mean, not to, not to challenge you, but in the sense that it depends your starting point and who you're speaking to. If you're speaking to an ardent Zionist, yeah, they're made who has grew up on the myths with all the sentiments and attachments that this was a beautiful fairy tale. You might want to start with a different, uh, slower mechanism of education, you know, rather than a heated debate. That's one thing. But there's two sides of this. One is this narration, which both of my colleagues talked about, which is the project of the settler project, which was also our dispossession and disintegration. But the other side of that is not only the dehumanization that has to happen, but I think equally important is the sentiments of solidarity and attachment that go towards a people that are struggling for their freedom. And in sympathy with that universalism of justice, that it's not only outrage at the crimes and a w wishing to stop those crimes, but also to stand or understand or have sympathy with those basic principles of human rights and international law and essential universalism that we need on our side that rehumanizes our own project and that side of it. So I agree with you about one has to explain that, but I think there's a level of strategies and tactics depending on your arena and audience about how you would go about that to be the most effective. But I think essential to that is the other side of that, which is what I was trying to talk about a little bit today. My audience is it's not the Zionist audience. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm an American Palestinian. Uh, I lived here since 1966, 
and uh, I always try to be objective in my feelings towards uh, the United States and what uh, the policies are. However, I agree with uh, Professor Peter Berg that we should stay away from uh, uh, subjective uh, feelings and stick with the objective findings. And I can tell you one thing going back to 1948, the creation of Israel, what ben Goyen said, what Golda Meir said, what the subsequent uh, uh, prime ministers said, they all didn't want to rec recognize any identity for the Palestinians. When Golda Meir was asked what's going to happen to the Palestinians, she answered by saying, what Palestinians? They don't exist. And the entire policy of Israel has been to destroy any identity for the Palestinians, whether it, it, it's by its actions in 1948 by the Darius massacre or by the attack in Gaza. They wanted to completely destroy every semblance of organization or society. Now my question is, why do you expect anything different from Netanyahu? The, the other question that I would like to ask and let the audience realize, I was told by Dr. Salim Tamari that Israel imported half a million Russian non-Jews, Russians, to Israel to do the work for them and serve in the army. And I don't see the normal justice or the world justice while denying the original people of that country from basic rights. I think insofar as the U.S. is concerned, Palestine is of Palestinians are of no consequence. I'm afraid that is what I believe. And I, I was saying in the case of Gaza, what now sticks in the throat is that this, in the past, and of course what happened in 48, even though it's on the record, and I have to share with you my own shock, the records that I've been looking at on 47, 48, 49 of U.S. policy are sitting right at Widener and probably at MIT Library. They've not been consulted by the great scholars of U.S. foreign relations post-World War II. It's still a mystery to me why. You don't have to go very far and you don't need big grants to go across the street. They're there. And the evidence corroborates what you were saying and more. But for the U.S., uh, since 48, uh, this is an impossible period to generalize about, but let's say uh, coming to the, to the more recent period. If you compare uh, U.S. interests in, U.S. investment in, U.S. Uh, defense and trade agreements with Israel, you understand that there's nothing comparable that is compelling for the U.S. I'm not talking on a moral level. I'm talking about economic interests primarily and political interests. Uh, with the Palestinians. The current situation is an embarrassment, and so is the, it, so is the election of Netanyahu. Uh, the, your question, what about Netanyahu? Netanyahu is going to force this administration either to do as he says, nothing, uh, and perhaps the belief is that by the inclusion of Barak, who is uh, not much better, uh, that uh, the U.S. will, uh, yes, much worse, that we'll, the U.S. will be kind and quiet. I think not. I think that the current situation now, because you have, uh, we didn't talk about General James Jones and Keith Dayton, the Americans who are on, the, the military who are on the West Bank, and their, their vision of a, of a larger American, uh, let's say, interest, and in, 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 um, as some ROTC students with whom uh, I spoke recently put it, uh, the occupation of the Middle East, uh, it may not be as easy for this administration to ignore and uh, therefore, I think that Netanyahu's uh, position, his openness, his bluntness, 
will force this administration either to appear as it is or possibly to make some movements. My sense is that the movements are going to be now, uh, please, please, we need a, uh, we've always wanted a two-party state, and by the way, all those, all those infinite roadmaps we've signed, let's reread them and see what's there. Well, some of them may have something within them that we need to reread, but I think your, uh, shall I say, sadness uh, and your, your uh, bitterness, I'm afraid, is justified. I hope I'm wrong. Um, well, first of all, just to make it absolutely clear, I'm not against uh, calling a spade a spade. In other words, the historical truth of the history of pal modern Palestine is that this is a settler colonial movement project that won. It's inherent in it the need to dispossess the uh, indigenous population, otherwise it couldn't have materialized. And I'm all in favor, and that's what I do in my writing and in my teaching, I, the only thing I said was that what well, Karma said be better than I, that I don't think unless you want to talk only to Palestinians, which is fair enough, or one wants to talk only to, to start from a statement, Zionism equals racism. I'm no, no aver not averse to discussing it, and I think to some extent it's not untrue. I just don't think it's an unhelpful, it's, it's a helpful uh, way to go about it. That's the second thing about Netanyahu, I think at the moment, he is, in a way, our greater, given the configuration of power and political reality, he is an unintended uh, political ally uh, of ours, and that's because he's, he's dropping the mask. Mm -hmm. In other words, what does Obama need? I mean, let, let's face it and not beautify the reality. Obama, unless, I'm prov unless proven differently, as, as far as I'm concerned, all the indications that he has given is... Middle East team, his national security team, his foreign policy team, is an APAC wish list. And um, I still have to, convince the, to be convinced that he's not a Clinton who happens to be African-American, a Bill Clinton who happens to be an African-American. And all he needed really, and that the Israelis spoiled it for him, the electorate, is for a Barack Livni government to be formed, which would say, yes, of course, we are in a peace process, and here are proposals, and they'll meet with Abbas uh, every other week, and uh, we'll discuss, and in the, meantime, in the meanwhile, everything will continue uh, as it has been, and of course, it wouldn't have made any difference. And uh, Barack is a much greater assassin than Netanyahu, there's no, no question about that. He has killed m many more Arabs, Palestinians, than, than Netanyahu ever has. So. Netanyahu, I don't know why he doesn't understand it. it. It would have been very simple for him to say, yes, of course, I'm for a peace process, and let's continue with the peace process. And, and, but the, the advantage he is, relative advantage he is, in a way, f for us, is that he is not willing to play that game. He's, for the time, being a principled man. He's sticking to his principles, which is, I don't want peace that, that is predicated upon compromising uh, or territorial compromise. I'm going to continue the settlements. I'm going to augment them. And therefore, he makes it very difficult for the game to continue. Um, and, and in that sense, I think he's not different. The difference is he is honest. The person next to the aisle over there. Yeah. Hi, uh, so perhaps I'm in a minority here, but I find it kind of ironic that in a talk called Gaza, there's not, no talk about Hamas as a terrorist organization whose charter, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, says uh, judgment day will come when the Muslims hunt down the Jews and, and find them behind the trees and kill them. If, uh, that's, that's the paraphrase. So my question to you is uh, actually two, two small questions. The first one is, uh, what, what's the purpose? Maybe, maybe I'm, uh, I, I don't understand this, but what's the purpose of firing missiles into... Uh, uh, civilian population into Starot, that's one question. And uh, the second question is, you said Hamas is a democratic organization, it was chosen, but uh, if I recall correctly, in 2006, it kind of threw off all the Fatah uh, leaders from the roofs in Gaza when it took over Gaza. Is that uh, very democratic? I, I was wondering kind of about that side of Hamas, not just the, the side that, that liberates Palestine or liberates the Palestinian people, but the terrorist organization side, which Israelis see more often. Thank you. 
I don't know if we have any Hamas representatives here, but would anybody like to uh, take a crack at? Sure. Yeah. Um, not speaking as a Hamas representative, <laughs> however, to try and talk about uh, the rockets, yeah, and Tisterot. Um The thing is, where we are now is the Israelis would like to have peace and quiet and no resistance without actually addressing the issues of injustice. Yeah. What is Terot built on? Yeah. Uh, destroyed Palestinian towns. You know, who are the people in Gaza? Yeah. The vast majority are the descendants and the refugees that were driven out, over which you and I yeah, have a conflict which we need to address. So you cannot guarantee your security. You cannot guarantee your security until you address the issues. Yeah. So I don't think that, you, that Hamas should fire into civilian areas at all. However, I do believe that there is a legitimate right of resistance as passed through a General Assembly resolution against colonial and military occupations. So I would say that it's legitimate to resist soldiers in the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, you may disagree with that. So we may have some disagreement. We may agree on the tactic that Hamas uses. I don't agree with it. I'm against it. But we may also disagree. I don't know, because I don't know what your views are. If your views are that the occupied Palestinian territories are liberated, territories that belong to the Jews. I don't know what your views are on those issues. I don't know if you think the settlers are legitimate in Palestinian land. So, you know, by the kind of questions you ask, you open up a range of other questions where I don't know where our differences and where our agreements, but I would agree with you on the tactic of firing rockets into Sterot. But for me, that's, I mean, th that may be for you something important but if you treat Palestinian lives as equally valuable as Israeli lives, then I think you would have to agree with me that the situation is not one of parity between two peoples and that however much you may say the Israelis have a fear of their security, for me I see, and I think it's clear, that you have the fourth largest military power in the world against an unarmed People. I don't see 10,000 Israeli civilians in Palestinian prisons. I don't see hundreds and hundreds of Palestinian civilians killed by tanks, by ship, by air. Yeah? So I don't think we're speaking. I mean, you're saying the Israelis have this fear, but I think the fear resides in a different area. The existential fear is not about their lives, but about something else that both Gabby and Irene a little bit we're talking about today. Uh, what happened in the summer of 2006, I think? Uh, you know, the, the, the battle between Fatah and Hamas fighters. Yeah? Now, you know, when you're talking about, you know, war crimes or Hamas fighters throwing Fatah fighters off roofs, yeah? And saying that that means that it's a terrorist organization. I don't agree. I don't think that's what defines it as a terrorist organization, and nor do I think it is a terrorist organization. So to have a party that's been democratically elected, yeah, able to form a government and serve in the Legislative Council, who was prevented from doing so by Israel, America, and some Palestinian interests, yeah, had created a horrible situation. Yeah. But you can look at the origin of that and the responsibilities for that elsewhere, I think. Thank you. I, yeah, I think, well, do, do we have time for, I'm being in, okay, just very quick responses and then we have to end the panel. Yeah, I, I, I want to say that, um, um, 
it's it's ironic to me suddenly how uh, Israel, pro-Israeli spokespersons have become such lovers and, and care, care so much about Fatah. Uh, suddenly they've all become uh, really concerned with the human rights and the safety and uh, uh, well-being of the uh, of the of the Fatah uh, warriors. The second thing I want to say is that. Um, when you have uh, your boot on somebody's throat for so long, when that somebody is trying to uh, remove the foot away and get loose, some of the ways in which he, would try, or he or she would try to do so are unpleasant. There's no question about it. Nonetheless, the attempt to get extricated from the, from the, from the boot that has been on your throat for so long is legitimate. And uh, there, is, there are no two ways about it. The final comment is that whatever, and I like Karma deplore uh, uh, shooting missiles at, at civilian places like uh, Sderot, and the, the, the ironic thing is that uh, uh, these rockets by people from Gaza are being thrown at the, some of the places from which they had been expelled um, originally, is that this doesn't justify the massacre of hundreds of civilian, uh, of the civilian inhabitants of Gaza through uh, the use of the weaponry that Israel has, has been using. There's no, otherwise the logic is that whatever your government does or whatever your leadership does holds accountable the whole population which it represents rightly or wrongly. And this is, I think, a very dangerous path to take. Thanks. I just want to uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, uh, a, a quick note for uh, literacy here, uh, more of it. I, I'm wondering if you are, uh, have followed uh, the statements uh, by Hamas as to their, uh, their position, their position on, on the conflict, their position with respect to uh, existing resolutions and so on. I think that might be useful if you follow the Israeli press. It's been in the Israeli press, and I'll be happy to tell you the dates. I have them in front of me, but I don't want to take the time. But I also want to know, uh, and you know you don't need to answer this now, whether you uh, have had the occasion to follow uh, the uh, Haaretz reports on uh, uh, not only um, uh, sol what I call soldiers' talk, but uh, what some call ironically the fashion industry and uh, what, uh, how that reflects on the vision, on the dehumanization of uh, Palestinians and what that means. I assume that, uh, as Karma said, I don't know either by your question what your own interests are. Your question stands alone, legitimately so, but it would be useful to know. But surely your question is a reminder to me that we haven't dealt with that, maybe because we all assume a, a common view towards it, uh, but perhaps it's something that one needs to do and not forget since we are, in principle, in favor of a, a common humanity. Thank you. So we have to end the panel now, but let's thank all the speakers, and then we'll resume shortly.